Hey, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. It's been a couple of months since we have done a live episode. And uh, as we were getting into the fall, which is when this is being recorded, I said to Nate, you know, we we were so good earlier in the year doing them every single month. And then I think summertime mm-hmm. hit. I started some new hobbies. Nate went up to Maine and was, I couldn't even get in touch I... with him. <laughs> no, you could. Dude, I sent you photos of the sourdough bread I learned how to bake. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> speaking of um, speaking of cu- culinary delights, this shows you what time of year it is. I'm now drinking my protein in pumpkin spice variety. They've done it, everyone. They've done it. Pumpkin spice protein. <laughs> wow. Anyway, yeah, I know, right? So we knew we needed to do another one. We put the call out a few weeks ago. We got some really great pre-submitted questions. We've got a pretty big live audience here today that we are going to uh, answer questions from uh, them as well, but we're going to jump into a first one. I'm keeping this one anonymous uh, since they asked me to. So if you ever want to submit something in the future, but like, oh no, it's too sensitive. I'm not sure if I if I should. This person straight up asked me in their question, hey, could you keep this anonymous? I'm going to, but I'm going to read this. I have a competitor who has been hiring our teachers away from us for the past five years. All right. The collective blood pressure of the audience like is going up already. (laughs) I know it was for me when I read this. Yeah. There have been too many overlapping teachers to think it's simply coincidence over the past year or two. I let go of some of them. Some of them actually chose to quit to choose the other school over us and vice versa. I feel this topic lines up with teachers asking for raises, which is, I think when this was submitted, we had just released this episode not too long ago. Maybe I'll have Bethany drop that in the show notes. Um, because this competitor simply puts me at an awkward position. Um, they don't have any... And Nate, this is where I, I'm going to be interested to see your take on this next part. Because this is kind of a convoluted story. Um, a lot of context, I guess. This competitor doesn't have any receptionists and believes good teachers will solve all the problems. On the other hand, my belief is that all three components of strong, strong systems, exceptional client service from our admin team, and inspiring teachers have to collaborate to have a successful music school. How would you overcome this competitor when it comes to keeping teachers without need to raise their rate to an unaffordable amount? And I just have to say, before I I go on, I love that we move to a a very pointed question at the end. If you're ever going to submit a question in the future, I love when a pointed question is asked. Because a lot of times we get stuff where it's just a giant context dump and it's like, okay, what do I do? It's like, well, what's the outcome you want? I love how this person put a... um, a point at the end. So Nate, I have a lot to say about this, but I actually, I actually want to hear you first. (laughs) Do you have a lot to say on this too, or should I jump in? Yeah, I think it's a, I love the question and I love the listener that's willing to put it in here for a whole host of reasons. First of all, it's hard to admit when things are going wrong. You know, it's hard to be like, man, I keep losing valuable teachers. It's hard to be like, it's actually really hard to ask for help at times, especially if you're um, this listener who's clearly invested a bunch of time into their program by developing strong systems, as they put it, exceptional client service, hiring and training an admin team, um, inspiring teachers. Obviously, this person is is not in years one through three of their journey, right? They've been doing this a while. Um, So the first thing, Daniel, that pops out to me is just like, you got to give props to any one of us at whatever growth stage we're at, where we're like, I don't know what's going on, but this keeps happening. So um, I would encourage all of us. I know I do this, Daniel, I know you do this in your own businesses, but, um, when I see a recurring issue, I, I know it's time to go to my brain bank, my friends who are in business, my mentors, my coach, whoever I need to go to, to who I think might have a different perspective. And so the very first part of my answer, dude, was not an answer that this person's going to love, which is that if you see a recurring problem in your business, likely you need to pull, put up a mirror and be like, oh, What's the one consistent feature of this issue? I'm at the center of it. So that's a 
that is a really hard place to be. Maybe, um, as you know, Daniel, like, you know, my role is to manage one of our most important resources, which is cash at Brooklyn Music Factory. So I just spent two months doing a, like, um, basically like a five-year payroll analysis from the last five years to figure out what we have been doing that has been consistent around pay, for, specifically for teachers, how we've mapped out a very clear growth curve for them so that they know where they come in and they know where they'll peak out, right? The most we'll ever pay at Brooklyn Music Factory per hour for a teacher who's in an hourly role. So I spent with Leah, my, um, you know, our, my part-time CFO bookkeeper, who I'm sure I've mentioned on the pod many times, but she's sort of like my brain partner on this sort of thing. I spent two months doing a deep dive on payroll because I actually didn't totally trust some of the payroll choices that I'd been making. Um, and I wondered whether or not I was being really consistent. And I wondered whether or not our teachers, if I were to pull them right now, they knew where their pay would be three years from now if they continued to develop as teachers and uh, you know, met all the benchmarks of success that we have at Brooklyn Music Factory. So that two-month research project was basically like an opportunity for me to go to somebody else. In this case, I went to Leah, and I was like, Leah, I need your help. Here's the deal. I want to be able to predictively say to any new teacher that we hire today where she can be five years from now. But I don't, I'm not yet certain that I can confidently give them these numbers over five-year growth plan in their pay. And so I turned to Leah and I was like, Leah, would you be willing to work on this project for the next two months with me? Which she was. And we didn't have tons of meetings. We had like three meetings. And I made it one of my three big threes for the summer was really mapping out payroll for all of our teachers um, with the end goal of being able to design a simple one sheet that I could say, here's where everybody starts. Here's where you can be three to five years from now. And here's exactly what it looks like in a simple infographic that I'm still working on, but at least I've finished all the math. I got all my spreadsheets done. I've done the brain work. So the first part of my answer, Daniel, is um, it sounds like our listener absolutely needs some outside help, and it's not going to come in a simple call in, right? If this is a recurring issue, then this is probably either a mentor or a coaching opportunity. In addition, and so that might be like, again, the listener might be like, well, that answer sucks, Nate. Like, I need a, I need a quick fix right now. The truth is, if it's is something as valuable as your number one resource, which is which are your teachers in the business we're in, they literally are the ones who deliver our service. If it's as valuable as that, then hell yeah, I'm going to make this a three to six month project and I'm going to invest some time and money into getting help. No question. I feel like there might be some assumptions that are happening right now. I agree. There is that one line in there. Go go for it, Nate. But that one line well, really stuck out to me. Yeah. Um, one of the assumptions I have is that that they're only leaving for uh, uh, money. For example, they they we did a they cited this great episode we did on teachers asking for raises. Um, the truth is, is usually when a teacher says I need a raise, it's reflective of something else. It can be something as simple as like they literally can't make their rent or their basic um, expenses. And so they're like, hey, Nate, is there any way I can make more here? Because right now I, this happens in New York City because obviously Brooklyn is, you know, the cost of living is one of the highest in the country. So people are like, I can't stay in Brooklyn any longer unless we can find a solution. And Brooklyn Music Factory isn't always going to be their solution, but I have great empathy for that question. But I was just having this conversation, Daniel, with my sister who just pivoted in jobs. She took a job. She did a midlife pivot where she took a job um, where she was no longer traveling, right? She was in sales and she had to travel a bunch. And she didn't want to travel anymore because her kids were at a chapter where she wanted to be at home as much as possible. Awesome. So she took a job that actually she was a little, she was definitely overqualified for. It was a lower position back working in a hospital um, in a context where she'd been working before. And eventually she had to leave it because it just didn't have the salary that she needed. 
right? But when they said, what would keep you? She said, well, actually, it's a couple of things. Number one, there needs to be like 20 or 30K a year more. But number two, I don't believe in this case, I don't believe a couple of my colleagues are in the right position uh, in the mid-management piece. I'm struggling with this person. And they were like, oh, tell me more about that. Right. So it was fascinating because there was definitely not money wasn't the only reason that she was ready to move to another position. She was like, if we could find this a solution to this other issue. And in the case of the gig she was doing, they were like, well, actually, there is another position available. to, And maybe we, you could give us a few weeks and we could find you that opportunity and it can pay more. And she was like, well, there's actually it's a two prong fork. Right. There's something else that's at play here. We I need to talk about some of the colleagues that I've worked with in, it, in terms of how we can, we can find a better um, working relationship. So that's my other piece of it. Usually, I, I feel like there's a couple of assumptions in there. And what I would love to do is encourage this listener to, um, if they have a strong relationship with us, some of these teachers that had to move on, um, in addition to the teachers that they have right now in their program, I would love to encourage them as part of this three to six month project of doing some more surveying, trying to figure out what's working really well for the teachers right now in their school and what's work, what hasn't been working so well where they can improve. And then if there's any opportunity to go to a few teachers that left, maybe they're still friends, they can be like, hey, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of like getting a coffee and just doing a little bit of a tell me what we could have done differently at the school separate from your pay rate. Uh, where can we improve? Like there's such massive opportunities in that version of an expert interview. And I think we did a cool app on that, but I'm going to stop there. That was a lot. And the first part of the answer probably wasn't the most encouraging though. I do believe that if you're, um, if you have the humility to ask this question, then it means you have the humility to be ready to do the hard work of fixing it long term. Mm. Well, Nate, you, um, I resonated with the first part. And I think that as long as it, like you did, as long as it's paired with practicality, it's a good one two punch to think of the external and the internal. The way that I'm going to go with this is maybe leaning a lot more on the practical side and maybe coming from the opposite direction. And I'd be curious to know your thought because this is quite uh, specific. I once had a school owner reach out to me. Uh, they had a massive school, 500 plus students. This school owner said to me in the email, you don't know me, but I know you. And the school owner proceeded to tell me in a rather lengthy email that they had lost a number of teachers over the past two years to another school. And this owner reached out to one of the teachers they lost. And through a kind of a long chain of things, they found out who that they had lost their teachers to and that that person had been working with me. And specifically wow. had, Im had implemented our group model. Mm. And part of the, and, and so the teacher said, yeah, they're paying significantly more at this school, which is why I left. It was, it was purely a financial decision. Now, Nate, this isn't to undermine what you were saying before. Um, not at all. Like, cause there's, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why people make the decisions they make, you know, um, long story short. This person reached out to me and said, I need you to teach this to me to, to remain competitive. Because this person, had this, uh, this the, my client, their school was so big in the city that they were pretty well known in this rather large city here in the U.S., like a top 10 city in terms of population. And teachers were, were coming to this school because they were paying so much more. And um, part of the reason is, is that one of the things I teach in my group model is to and so what I would say is some, sometimes you have to look at what teachers are saying to you, as Nate, as Nate said, you, have, you should survey those teachers. You should talk to them. You should get really familiar with, with the reasons they say they're leaving 
And then don't even accept surface level answers. Really talk through and make sure that they aren't disguising the real reason they're leaving under something that's more palatable or maybe more socially acceptable. And I think, again, Nate kind of alluded to this in, in his answer. But then there are strategies that you can use to, to kind of stem the tide. You can make programmatic decisions that will allow you to, um, to take care of your teachers really, really well. And, and that is you know another one of the stated reasons why a system like Piano Express can be so good for a school is because it it gives you options that you simply don't have in certain other lesson models. And one of them is just to take, quote unquote, take care of your teachers better. Daniel, can I, I pulled up, um, I pulled up this research that we've cited before, which is this Gallup poll that where they, they essentially call it the Q12 index, which is like the 12 questions um, that they are, Essentially, the answers to def will determine whether or not your employees want to stay at your company. This mm. is a 30-year-long research project that they've been doing where they've been interviewing millions and millions of employees. Wow. Uh, and it, at Brooklyn Music Factory, we, we simmered it down. We're just like, let's just look at the six. I put them in the chat for our listeners here, but I'm going to read them out loud real quick. And then I want to just circle back and put a button on the answer to this question by going back to your um Pay is important comment, which it 100% is. So hold on one sec. Question number one, do you know what is expected of you at work? Okay, just to put this very clearly, that the schools that are generally, that we work with, that generally have the most difficulty keeping teachers will oftentimes have the most independent type of culture. In other words, teachers do whatever they want in the classroom, but they're not quite sure how they're measured. Uh, how success is measured across the entire company, right? They're, right now, they're measuring success entirely based on an individual student and their relationship with that one student, but they don't know how to connect that to the whole school, right? So do you know what's expected of you at work? How do we measure success? Do you have the materials and equipment to do your work right? This is massive. And Daniel, when you look at your group lesson answer, when you talk about like the value of bringing on a curriculum like Piano Express, right away, numbers one and two are pretty damn clear. You're like, here's exactly what a school studio needs to have to pull off a group piano class. Equipment, materials. Here's the app. By the way, I've just, as an owner of a school, I've just invested all these resources in licensing a curriculum. Um, so I'm giving you the materials to succeed. I literally just got off a call with an awesome school owner in Texas talking just about the Mini Keys Jam Band 101 and the Songwriters Journey Curriculum. And most of their questions were around how do you support our teachers so that they know how to succeed? And so we were just going through all of the resources, literally the minute by minute lesson plans that we provide. You know, that's what we're talking about here. Questions number three is, at work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? Four, that's, in other words, putting your teachers in a position to succeed. Don't hire someone who went and got a, a master's in piano curriculum and put them in a group lesson class on songwriting with four and five-year-olds and expect them to succeed, right? They didn't need massive training. Being a virtuoso is not going to help you in the context of that classroom, right? In the last seven days, have you received recognition or praise for doing good work? My guess is the listener, these questions will be amazing for them. Like maybe they did not praise their teachers and their staff often enough. And so they never knew whether they were appreciated. So they decided I'm going to go lowest common denominator and just look for more money. That's a sign of appreciation is more money, right? Five and six, does your supervisor or someone at work seem to care about you as a person? This piece cannot be overstated. You hire a teacher and then you care about them as a human. Like there are so many ways you can do this. Daniel and I have talked about this in different pods. We just finished our two-day training at Brooklyn Music Factory. We closed with an open tab at the bar around the corner, food, drinks for two hours. I just gave the I just gave the credit card to Josh, one of our mini keys jam by one on one teachers, and I was like, I'll see you there in about an hour. And they just went over there and it was just a hang. Daniel and I will be hanging there soon this fall. 
<laughs> I was just getting ready to say, Nate, which one is it? Because I've been to BMF enough that I might have been there. And we'll probably take our Founders Forum uh, folks we'll... <laughs> there as well. The Finback is great. And man, yeah, it yes. was Finback. And uh, they have some killing dumplings. Okay. Um, and then number th six is, do you have a best friend at work? This one is crazy when you think about it. You're like, wait. Do you have a best, like that's the sixth most important indicator as to whether or not your teachers are going to stay at your school? Well, the reality is, is all, all any of us have to do is take a moment and contemplate when, we, when we've ever stayed anywhere for any length of time, whether it was like at your church, at a place of employment, at the gym. Like if you don't have a friend at these places, the likelihood of you being there three years from now is pretty low, even at a gym, right? It's like nobody likes to just punch the clock, hit the Stairmaster and leave and never say hello or know anybody, right? That's not the way those places work. Really great gyms build a community where when you walk through the door, they're like, how you doing, Nate? Back at the spin class, I see. And that like, it's like you just feel connected, right? So I was going to, I was going to, sorry, I want to talk about the money for a second. So one of the reasons why I loved your answer, Daniel, around being able to pay more in a group class, we don't need a spreadsheet really to look and know why the margins allow us to pay more per hour in a group piano class or in a mini keys class, et cetera. But where this becomes extremely valuable is not just in that classroom, but it allows you to then find a middle ground around your pay across all offerings. So if you have high margins in a group class, you have lower margins in a one-on-one -on -one private lesson, now all of a sudden you're finding that medium pay that goes across the board for all your teachers, right? It doesn't have to be just for that teacher that goes into the group class. In fact, I would dissuade you from all of a sudden paying what you, the max on the group class teacher. I would say take that opportunity for an hourly and then find a median between your private lesson and the group class hourly and use that power of the group class to start retaining teachers across all of your offerings.